Magandang umaga po. That is uh, good morning in our language. And po is a word of respect. That means I respect you. I am Henry Ventura and uh, let's show the PowerPoint. This is my family, Cora is my wife, and we have two sons, Easy is for Ezekiel. He's 38 years old, and he's uh, working in Canada. He's been there one year. And Melvin is our youngest, he's 34. He's uh, still living with us, but he, he has work, so he stays with my wife uh, at home. We are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, I was born and raised a Roman Catholic. And being Roman Catholics, we were taught to work our way to heaven and try to be good enough and try not to do bad things because that would take us to hell. So we, we, try, we tried our best. We did all the ceremonies. And uh, when, when I got home, I knew I was not good enough to go to heaven. And I was hoping I was not bad enough to go to hell. So my hope was to go to purgatory. And uh, I, I read the Bible and I could not find purgatory anywhere. So uh, my only hope was gone. So I was reading books and trying to, uh, to understand and find a way to go to heaven. I, I read about Hinduism, Buddhism, and the different uh, cults and denominations and all the teachings. One day I found an ad in the newspaper. And it said, if you want to go to heaven, write to us. So I wrote to them, of course. <laughs> it was a correspondence course. And they, they explained that, no, you cannot be good enough to go to heaven. But Jesus Christ died for you. And if you believe in him, you, you put your faith in him, then he will, he will take you to heaven with him. And that was, wow, the wonderful news that I learned. And I told everybody, my parents, uh, I was very happy I told them. They were not happy. <laughs> so I told my cousins, my siblings, every day I have the list of people to go to. And I told them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Some be believed and became Christians later on, and uh, some did not. And I, I talked to Cora, I was dating her. She was uh, working at a store, and at that store she was selling Bibles and statues of Mary and the saints. And so I told her about the Lord Jesus. And I said, why, why are you selling your God? She said, no, I'm not selling my God. And I said, why don't you read the Bible with me? Then you will see what I mean. She said, okay. And uh, I didn't know where to start. I did not have any training. So I started at the end, the book of Revelation. We, we read the book of Revelation together. And... She believed. She actually understood because the Lord opened her heart and her mind and understood the gospel. So she told everybody, her, her siblings, her parents, and friends, everybody she knew. And beca many became Christians because of her testimony. We got married two years after and we just had this passion to tell everybody. So we went to a community uh, like uh, half an hour away. We went on my motorcycle and we would teach the Bible to people. And uh, I did not have any training. I, did, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew John 3.16 and a few other verses. So I would read the story from the Bible and explain it the best way that I could. 
And so we, we had a group of 30 people coming together. Well, we would teach six groups in one day. And almost every day we would do that. And uh, we, were, we had 600 bucks for, for income. It, it did not require too much work. So I could devote my time to sharing the word of God to the people. And people started calling me pastor. Because I was preaching on Sundays and we were having Bible studies and I was baptizing people. <laughs> and uh, they called me pastor. I said, no, don't call me pastor. Just call me Kuya. Kuya is older brother. And, uh, but they insisted, okay, pastor. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. I was pastoring them. So then one day, Larry Salisbury, you know him? Have you met him? Larry Salisbury is one of uh, Ed Arndt's friends. And he said, Henry, you should come. You should get some training. I said, I'm, I'm too busy. Uh, I don't have time to go to, to school. She said, and he insisted. And so as a friend, I went to the Bible study, to the uh, training, and I found out that what I was doing was dangerous, actually. I could be teaching the wrong things to these people, and they were looking up to me and listening to me. So I learned to, through the training that there is a system to understand the Bible. And I need to understand what God means by what is written. It is not up to me to interpret it the way I, I like. And my prayer was, God, what do you mean by this? And how can I explain it so that people can understand? They cannot obey you if they don't understand it. And so through this training, I learned that I must be careful to understand God's meaning and explain it in a simple manner so that people can obey God. And I must be careful not to twist or, or change God's message. That was life-changing for me. It changed everything. My, my outlook on life and the way I treated my wife and the people I was ministering to, they were not my members. They were God's people. And I must be careful how I treat them. And so uh, as I was going through this training, it took three years. I became a translator. Uh, I translated the materials into our language, Tagalog. And uh, later on, I became a coordinator. That meant I was then starting training other people using these same materials while I was still being trained. And uh, that was in 2001. I started this training. And soon we had people coming. And uh, we started classes all over the Philippines. Next slide, please. Next slide. There. And we had 2,342 students. Before the pandemic, we had 1,500. But now it's 2,400. We have 133 teachers and 2,190 graduates. So we are, we are, that is what we are doing now in partnership with, with Calvary. We are training pastors and church leaders who do not have the, the training that they need, just like what happened with me. Because there are many pastors who have the passion and they, they do, do this with their, all their hearts, but not really knowing what they were doing. So that's what I'm bringing to them. Instead of taking them out, taking them to a Bible school, we take the training to them so that they can continue their serving God and learn how to do it properly. And I, I thank you for your partnership. I thank you for your help. 
that's how we reach these pastors in the field. Next slide. Uh, next slide. <laughs> During the pandemic, uh, this is this is our team. Uh, we have we have a team of people training leaders all over the place. Next, please. COVID nineteen came. Everything was shut down. We could not come to church. We could not do our training. I, as a um, um, senior citizen, was not allowed to go out of our yard. We could not buy food. There was no, no transportation. We are, in the Philippines, are dependent on public transportation. Most of us do not have our own vehicles. But everything was shut down. There were uh, checkpoints every two kilometers. And you could not get to the next village unless you had a special permit from the government. So people were getting hungry. And we, we didn't know what to do. We had some food uh, in the house, but that was soon gone. And then someone came up with the idea of community pantries. If you had extra food, you put it on a table outside of your house, and anyone who was hungry can get some food for themselves. But if they had some extra food, they would put that on the table. And that, that idea spread, and many people did that. And that helped us survive the physical hunger. But there was a greater hunger. I was spiritual. Because we could not go to church. We were not allowed to meet. Uh, I know that uh, that is different here in, in the U.S. But in the Philippines, if the government says, don't meet, then we don't meet. And so uh, we met secretly. Don't tell our government. <laughs> <laughs> so, so people started to meet in, in homes, in people's homes, to worship God together. Not, not as a whole congregation, but maybe 10 people at one place. And also our classes, our training classes, Met online, we discovered Zoom. <laughs> and so uh, the classes were seen. And we were able to enroll pastors in the mountains, like tribal pastors, because they could just get a phone and, and join the training. And we started a class in Saudi Arabia, which was not allowed, uh, you know, you cannot bring any religious books there. But we were able to start a class there. And we had a class in Hong Kong, Australia. And soon we were, we were the population of our students actually grew from 1,500 to 2,300 students. Praise the Lord. Because he can take an obstacle and change it into a stepping stone to glorify his name. We didn't know about this technology before, but now there was this tool that we can use. And so the population grew and you know, we had graduations. Even our graduations were online. So even after, uh, even during the pandemic, the ministry actually grew. Next slide. We had more students, even some graduated, some could not continue, some people died, or many people died. The, the training actually grew in numbers. And we were able to reach even the remote areas of the country where we could not go before. Next slide, please. Hmm. 
Okay. So in 2019, it's just more than 1,000 students, but it grew. And now at the end, it's July 2023, and it's still growing. So praise the Lord. I am really thankful that God is doing this. This is a testimony of Ray E. Cole. Ray E. Cole is a, is a civil engineer. Uh, he developed subdivisions, housing projects, and he was one of our students. And uh, when, he, when he finished, when he graduated, he put together this group of people and trained them to plant churches. They, uh, what they would do was uh, the whole church. They would meet on Sunday, and after, after the worship service, they would go on pickup trucks, you know, in, in the back of the pickup truck. And then they would drop off people, like two or three, in a community. Go on to the next community and drop off two or three people. And one family at one place. And those people, they would share the gospel with the community. They would tell their testimonies. Even children were included in these, in these teams. He said, if you are not going to be involved in ministry, go to another church, not this church. He involved everybody, just like what God wants us to do. That every member, every believer should be involved in ministry, making disciples. And so by doing this, they planted 25 churches, some in Muslim communities, because the Muslims saw that these people loved them. They were not afraid of them. And they continue doing that. They, they, uh, uh, they have planted 25 churches, and they, have, they are training the third batch of church planters right now. And Ray Cole became the president, not the chairman, but the president of the Southern Baptist denomination in the Visayas and Mindanao. That's the lower part of the Philippines. And he's visiting every Southern Baptist church in the Philippines to tell them, you need to go out. Don't be satisfied with staying inside the church building and, you know, just talking about the Bible go out to the community. And that's what he's doing now. Next slide. Oh, there. They have baptized more than 600 believers since 2016. Next. And another one, one of our students, he graduated in 2004 and planted nine churches. He's now training people, pastors. And uh, he is telling his students support Crossing Cultures International, our ministry, because we are making an impact in the, in the Christian world. Next slide. So this is the Philippines. We have identified six places where God is leading us to train more people. Please pray for that. That is my prayer request. Please pray for the ministry. And we are expanding in more areas. There are Pastors are asking us, come, please, train us. And so uh, that's what we're doing. I have a team of, uh, uh, these are volunteers, eight pastors who, who are being trained right now. And these eight pastors go on their motorcycles and drive for eight hours, eight hours to go to a remote place to train the pastors there. They bring their own food with them, rice, and someone provides them with fish, and that's, that's good enough. <laughs> so, so they stay overnight, they train those pastors, stay there for the night, and then drive another eight hours back to their hometowns to continue ministry. I'm just I'm sharing that. I want to get excited with the ministry that we are all doing, and the, you are part of this. And I thank God. I would like to share with you um, just a short message from God's Word. And I 
it is a very encouraging message to me as I read it. And I understood it, praise the Lord. <laughs> this is uh, actually God's last message to our dying world. The last message that was left. And we want to hear this. We have uh, largely recovered from the pandemic, but the world is, is not doing any better. So I would like to read this, uh, the word of God and encourage you with this. Let's pray for, uh, for a moment. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing in the Philippines. Uh, Lord, help us understand your word this morning so that we can obey, we can follow your will, and we can do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have recovered from the pandemic mostly. We still wear masks in some places. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, our president of the Philippines declared the pandemic to be over. So I'm thankful to our president. He finished the pandemic in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> but we have learned to be cautious. You know, when someone coughs, you move away. <laughs> Some people were coughing on the plane, <laughs> but they could not move away. <laughs> but we learned to wear our masks, you know. And uh, we learned during this pandemic that uh, this world is very fragile. Any moment, another pandemic can come. We are we're not free yet from that. And the environment is deteriorating. Even our effort to build uh, energy efficient vehicles produces pollution. The, the batteries that we produce, they, you cannot just throw it away because it's going to pollute the environment. And the process of making those batteries pollutes the environment. Our efforts to solve our problems are not making the world better. It's, uh, we have the internet, we, we have uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and all, all those things, but the, the internet brings disinformation and propaganda and all sorts of fraud. This world is not getting better. I heard that June was a pride month. Wow. <laughs> and uh, children are now allowed to choose their own gender. They don't even know that veggies are good for them. <laughs> How can they make these decisions? It is a dying world, but God has a message for us. God has a message for us. And not just a message, it's a letter. He wrote a book in the Bible. And it, he wants us to read it. Have we read the book of Revelation? I'm excited about this. Because when Cora read it, she became a believer. Well, it opened her mind. This message is from God himself, the owner of the universe. And, you know, it talks about Jesus Christ. It's a revelation. It reveals, it shows who Jesus Christ is and what his plans are for the future. He wants us to know what's going to happen. And so we should not be afraid to read it. And we should not avoid reading it. God wants us to be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's last message to this dying world. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which can mean it's revealing who Jesus Christ is, or it's coming from him, but both true. 
The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. He wants to show his bond servants. Are you a servant of God? Then this is for you. He wants to show you what will soon take place. If someone writes a letter to me, I'm excited to read it. Aren't you? I want to read what he has to say. And he, God wrote this for us. Imagine that. We were not even born when this was written. And he was thinking of us. And he wants us to know what's going to happen. To show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. It's sooner now than when it was first written. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. The reason is because the time is near. It was near then, it's near now. And it's a message from God himself, and it's a message for his servants. It's a very important message. It's supposed to be an encouragement to us. We're not supposed to be discouraged because of the things that are happening around us. We're supposed to be encouraged because of this message, because God is planning something good and something exciting for us. And if, if, if our direction in life is not in the direction that God wants, then we, make, we need to make corrections. You know? We need to change course so that we follow what God wants us to do. It's supposed to change our outlook in life. I will talk to you later about that. But some people are afraid some people are afraid to read this book and they are confused and they get bogged down in the details and they and the debates and arguments about the different aspects of this letter but this is a simple letter really it's a simple message it is a message that brings blessing blessed or happy or fortunate is he who reads, and those who hear, and those who heed, or take seriously, or take to heart what is written in this book. Have you all written, uh, read this book? I hope so. Because he says the time is near. We have a dying world, but the first thing we see here is that we have a living Savior. Our Savior is alive. He did not remain in the grave. He's actually listening to us. That's just mind-blowing that our Lord is actually listening to us. And He's concerned about us, and he was the best for us. He is our eternal God, and it's from him. And he is called the faithful witness. What is a faithful witness? It's someone who, who testifies, who says the true, the true things. He's not a liar. He says here, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace you and peace from him who is and who was 
and who is to come. He is eternal. Who is, who was, and who is to come from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. What Jesus says is true. And he is alive. Would you listen to a liar? Of course not. You would want to listen to a person who says what is the truth, and he is the truth. A faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, is the first one to die but live again and not die again. And he's above anyone. Firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. We need to listen to his message. He's the king. He's alive. And he tells the truth. And to see this to him who loves us and releases us from our sins. This person, this Jesus, loves us. And he released, released us from our sins by his blood. He gave his own life. He wanted, or he wants us, he wants to release us from our sins. Many people, have been released from their sins. The door has been opened. The door of the jail has been opened. They just like to stay inside. They just don't want to walk out of there. That's why some Christians, you, you don't see the, the Christ-likeness in them because they are comfortable inside the jail. But Christ has released us from our sins by his own blood. He loves us so much that he gave his own life so that we can be free from sin. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father. And to him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I could say so many things here. But this is, this is the important point here in verse 7. <clears throat> Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Behold, look. Do we look up with expectation and with excitement that he is coming back? You see, sometimes we get so busy with our world. We forget this fact that he, this is his message and this is his promise. He is coming back. Lord, we cannot fix this world. It's dying. It's corrupt. It's deteriorating every day. Lord, come and save us. You know, in, in in my life as a Roman Catholic, I, I knew Jesus is the Christ. All right, Jesus Christ. I thought Christ was a surname, a family name. But there's no Joseph Christ or Mary Christ. Just Jesus Christ. Because Christ is the anointed one. It's a title. He is anointed. He's the Savior, the King. And this Savior King is coming back. He is alive and he's coming back for me because he loves me. I find when I go to the mountains down in Mindanao, south of the Philippines, and even in the cities, they say Jesus is Christ. Jesus Christ. But it's just a word, just a name. It doesn't mean anything to them. And there are places where I have to explain to them that we, because he is the Christ, 
and he is the living God and he, we pray to him stop praying to the spirits in the rocks and the trees and the river there are still places where they do that the word divata which means fairy that's the same word they use for God it's amazing uh, even in the in the urban areas, when they go out at night and it's it's dark and they walk, they say, "Excuse me," because there might be a dwarf or a spirit there, and they might step on that spirit, and they will get sick. So they say, "Excuse me." They think that you can believe in the true God, Yahweh, and still believe in these spirits and offer chicken to those spirits. They kill a chicken for the blood on the ground. When they build the bridge, they pour blood on, on the pilings, like a pig's blood because they have to offer blood for the safety of their children. And in these cases, we need to explain to them, there is only one true God. And if you really believe in this one true God, you have to turn your back on the other gods or other spirits that you are talking to. And you're asking for protection from. It's still very common to have amulets. Right outside this big Catholic church in Manila, there are little stores selling amulets together with some liquid for those who want to abort their children. And they have candles that to light so that someone will be attracted to you. Just different things. Superstition. And we take it for granted. We, we live in a modern era. But these things still exist. In Thailand, you go. Every house is a spirit house. A small house right in front of the house so that the spirits will go there and not inside the house of the human beings. Many people are not aware that much of the world still does not know our true God. And sometimes we get too comfortable and not think about these things. But I am very happy that Jesus Christ promised that he is coming back. And he says he is coming back and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. This means those who have died will be resurrected. We have a corrupt world, but we have a holy God. We have a dying world, but we have a living Savior. And the, the world is confused. But Jesus Christ is the truth. And he is coming back. And he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. Who is, who was, and to who is to come. The Almighty. Verse number 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Who is and who was. And who is to come. The Almighty. And these are the words of Jesus Christ. He called himself the Almighty. And he's coming. Wherever did you hear of a God coming back to save his creatures, his creation? This is a simple message, really. In the book of Revelation, says a simple message. Uh, Cora, my wife, she's, she's teaching the ladies in our, in our neighborhood, uh, six grandmothers. 
And they come to our house, and she, uh, she disciples them. Also the children in the yard, they come. And uh, Cora said, why don't you teach them the book of Revelation? <laughs> I said, okay, I'll, I'll teach them the book of Revelation. Old women, some can't even read. And I thought, how can I teach them this book? I have to simplify it, but not change it. I have to present it in a simple way and point out to them what is important. And what is important? That Jesus Christ is coming back. And he says he's coming back and he is bringing his reward for those who are faithful. He is coming back to judge those who don't believe. And he is coming back to forgive those who are repentant. It's simple. Let us not be bogged down by the details and things that we do not understand, but be clear or, or be able to understand what is presented clearly. He brings rewards for the faithful. Chapter 22, verse 6. This is from the angel who was showing John. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. The God of the spirits of the prophets. It's not just the prophets. It's the God of the spirits of the prophets who is saying these things. And what does he say? Verse 7, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed, you are happy, you are fortunate. If you take to heart, if you take it seriously, the words of the prophecy of these books. These words are faithful and true. In verse 7, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed it she who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. In verse 10, and he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Do not seal up. Why? For the time is near. You don't have to lock the door if you are going to come back right away. All right? You lock it because you're going away for a long time. But now, the time is near, so don't lock it. Don't seal the words of this book. It is getting closer, much closer than we realize. Sometimes we forget. Verse 22, oh, chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus Christ speaking. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. You see that? It's, it's re repeated. He's, he's saying that over and over. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to everyone according to what he has done. What we're doing matters. My reward is with me. You know, when I was a new Christian, I thought, I said to myself, I am saved. That's enough for me. Even if I don't get any reward, that's okay. As long as I'm going to heaven, that's fine. But Jesus is excited. I am bringing my reward with your reward. I am bringing with me the reward for what you're doing. And I go, nah, I don't need it. <laughs> it's not important. No, we must be excited because this is something important. Jesus Christ himself is preparing this reward. What are those rewards? I don't know. But I'm excited when I receive a Christmas gift 
It's gift wrapped. I don't know what's inside, but I'm excited to open it. I'm excited to see what the reward will be. Are you? Will you be receiving a reward? Or lots of rewards? God is so good. He doesn't even need us. He doesn't even need anything. And yet he is preparing rewards for those who are doing something for him. See what he says here? My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Are we doing something that to, that merits a reward? What are we doing? What are we doing to prepare for Christ's return? I sure hope that something that I'm doing will merit a reward. It's up to God, you know. The giver has the prerogative of giving what he wants to give. But I'm excited, whatever that is. <laughs> Let me go back to Luke 21 and uh, just look at this verse quickly. Luke 21, 34 and 35. 21, 34 and 35. Be on guard, Jesus himself saying this, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that they will not come to on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Be on guard. And he says, maybe, maybe we are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and wait, worries of life? I might be. Sometimes we get too worried about this life here. This is not our true life. Sometimes we have our eyes on things of this world. Maybe we're not greedy or anything or doing evil things, but we are too worried about the life here. There is a greater life that is waiting for us. And he says, do not be weighed down by these things. See, it changes our perspective. We are no longer supposed to think or to be occupied, preoccupied with the things of this world, but with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what should occupy our minds. Watch and pray always, it says. In First John 3.20, 3, 2. 1 John 3, 2. Let's see. 1 John 3, verse 2. Behold, now we are children of God. Amen? We are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But, See this. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We don't know what we will be, but the important thing is we will see him as he is and we will be like him. I don't know what way, but we will be like him. And everyone, verse 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself purifies himself just as he is pure. We have no control over what we will be when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have some, then an assignment here. Everyone who has this soul fixed on him 
purifies himself. We are supposed to purify ourselves, live holy lives, because he who is holy is coming. He is coming back. And we shall be like him. I will exchange this body anytime. <laughs> I am ready to have it, uh, you know, have it replaced. And we'll go to the signature of this message. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, the signature of this letter, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. Jesus Christ himself, he signed the letter. And the spirit and the bride, the bride is the church, and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Yes, come. Come, Lord Jesus. And Jesus says, what does he say? Verse 20, yes, I am coming soon. I am coming quickly. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your promise. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for this wonderful promise that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Lord, let us fix our eyes on this hope and live as we are supposed to live in preparation for the Lord's coming. Lord, we, we know we need to live in this world for now, but let us not be preoccupied and too worried about this life here. But wait and watch and pray and keep our perspective on the true life that is coming. Thank you, Lord. Help us to live godly lives and help us to serve, to serve you and serve other people while we are waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.